Amos 9. I think Allie wants to go skiing. Tuesday, February 22nd, skiing at Bittersweet. Two for two, uh, two for Tuesday, lift tickets 29, ski rental 22. If you want to have a pre-skiing lesson, we could like to have somebody get on the roof and ride it right down this way. That may be going down. It'd be a soft landing if the snow goes before you. So any one of you two, right after church. Oh. That might go here. Here in a second, nothing goes. Okay, we're in Amos 9. How's Aunt Pauline doing? Okay. Broke her pelvis and hip. Oh, okay. No new parts. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us now as we uh, open up your blessed word. I pray you'd help us to understand it, help us to be faithful to it. I pray you'd help us to uh, look forward to the day when you come back. Boy, it's going to be an awful day. It's going to be an awful day for a lot of people. And uh, Lord, I do pray you'd help us to rejoice in the day for the saved. But help us to witness to the lost until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, chapter 9. This is it. Down to 15 verses. Should get through it. And remember that Amos was a country boy that uh, warned Israel about uh, 70 years before their destruction. I don't know if the people paid attention to him or not. Now, in chapter 9, you've got some weird stuff in here. you got some some ideas that may be foreign to a lot but this is an advantage when you go verse by verse uh, teaching through the Bible is that uh, when you go verse by verse people pick up on it that you uh, are weak on certain verses oh why did he look over that one why didn't he say anything about that you know and, and this is the best way to learn the Bible going verse by verse and that's the route that I like to go I've been doing that for a long time and it always amazed me how the Lord would seem to have uh, the right uh, idea or topic that uh, came up at a certain time that was needful for the church, even when you go verse by verse. Uh, chapter 9, the first 10, let's see, first 10, maybe at a paragraph mark. Nope, first 10 verses is uh, absolute total negative that uh, Joel Osteen will never discuss. In fact, he doesn't know anything about it. Uh, verse 11 to 15 is a positive. That's the uh, restoration of the nation of Israel. And so chapter 9 is what to be is known to be the major doctrine of the Bible, the second coming of Christ. Joel chapter 2 says that the day of the Lord is a day of gloominess. And when we read down through chapter 9, we'll see how bad it gets. Okay, this is how bad it gets for Israel and the people that are on earth during the tribulation when Christ comes back. And then the great hope of uh, verse 11, going into the restoration of the nation of Israel, and uh, the great promises that will take place during the thousand-year reign of Christ. So this is um, prophetically, he's writing prophetically. Many of these prophets wrote, uh, as far as their prophecies, had a twofold meaning. One is for... Uh, the immediate cause, okay, and then the second meaning was a doctrinal influence. This one is more doctrinal than anything. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1, uh, Amos said, I saw, I saw, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. Okay, a seer in the Old Testament is somebody who saw the future. A prophet is somebody who knew the future. John is not the only one that saw the future. In Revelation, John actually envisioned or saw the uh, book of Revelation in, uh, unfold in front of him. Actually put him in a time machine and, trans and put him into the future. And that's nothing with God. God can do something like that. And while he was in the future, he was looking back to the past when he was alive. When you look at, if you look at the book of Revelation through the eyes of the writer, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, which is our time period, was past. 
Revelation 4 through 19, which is future for us, was present tense for John. And then the future tense was Revelation 21, 20, 21, 22. So Amos saw this. He actually saw this vision. Uh, it's not like uh, Oral Roberts' 900-foot Jesus. Okay, he actually saw something about the Lord. The Lord was standing. The reference in the Bible when the Lord stands, that is a reference to his second coming. He stands before he comes down to earth. In the story of Stephen, when it says that Stephen uh, was being stoned, that he saw the Lord standing on the right hand of the Father. The reason why he was standing was not to receive his gentle spirit into heaven. If the Lord received the gentle spirits of all saved people in heaven, be by, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It was because in Acts 7, if the Jews would have received the message from the Jewish uh, disciple or the Jewish um, deacon, I guess you could say, if they would have received his message that they murdered Messiah, then they would have repented as a nation, gone down and sacrificed a red heifer, would have been forgiven as a nation, Christ would have came back, probably in rapture, probably seven year tribulation, Judas would have come back, and everything was all set and ready to go for uh, the seven year trib and then the millennium. Where we would have been in the, in the mix, who knows? I'm kind of glad they rejected his message because we got in the mix. Okay, then chapter 8 of Acts is when Saul shows up, and then chapter 9 he becomes Paul. So that's when you read through the book of Acts, and it says the Lord is standing. Okay, also in James chapter 5 it mentions that the Lord is standing, and James is a letter written to the 12 tribes. And it's funny when you read that, if you read any commentaries on the epistle of James, it is utter, absolute nonsense. I mean, these guys sometimes are so smart or stupid. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes. And the commentaries will immediately say that's Jewish Christians. First off, it doesn't say Christians. It's the 12 tribes. And that's pretty deep. That's pretty profound. You really got to get educated to figure that out. The 12 tribes are laid out in Revelation 7 and 14. Okay, that's the Jewish tribes that are scattered throughout the world during the tribulation time period. And so a lot of times these people who read these commentaries, they are now approaching the Bible with a preconceived idea. And it's not, it's tainted their thinking. Okay, so chapter 9, verse 1, he says, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. And he said, smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake. Cut them in the head. Cut them in the head? Cutting who in the head? Cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Who's he talking about? Amos is prophesying to Israel. Somebody is getting beheaded. Somebody is running for their lives. Okay, and they're not going to get away from it. The somebody that's going to be beheaded, you find them in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4, the souls are beheaded during the tribulation time period. Isn't it any wonder that we are seeing the Muslim grow throughout the world? They're infiltrating every nation. Is it any wonder that the Muslims' favorite mode of execution is cutting somebody's head off? Is it any wonder that we have a president that's a Muslim? Okay, and uh, this is, these are all signs of prophecies. Man, we are living in an exciting time to see the prophecies laid out right in front of us. Okay, and so... Uh, these people are running for their lives. Verse 2, it says, Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Notice mine hand. God is using, will be using these Muslim nations to kill the Jewish people in the tribulation. They will become God's servant as 
Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant, as Cyrus was God's servant. And with Nebuchadnezzar, they uh, took to Israel captive for 70 years. Okay, they shall dig into hell. So we know that hell's down. Then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So maybe they have some sort of capability. Now verse 2, they dig into hell. Is it any wonder that secret societies, uh, men uh, that movers or shakers of the world, okay, will have underground uh, cities and underground places where they, they uh, will hide down there while the world is in destruction. In 1957, a, a woman named Ann Rand was a mistress of Rand McNally. She wrote a book, and if you get on the internet, the uh, secular movement, they will say this is a masterpiece of a book. This is an amazing book. The book was called Atlas Shrugged. Uh, in this book, if you're an uh, insider, uh, insiders will often buy a $100 copy of this book. Like Christians often have a big family Bible set on their coffee table. Okay, but uh, insiders will buy a big, uh, expensive copy of this book. When I looked that up, you know, when I first heard about that, I thought, well, I'm going to get that thing and read that thing. And I got the internet and I thought, 100 bucks, forget it. I'm not going to get that thing and read it. But then I found a paperback copy. So I found his paper back copy, and so in 1957, Anne Rand wrote in her book the plans that the insiders have to, over, to uh, conquer America and the world. And John Galt was the name of a fellow in that book. And basically, when you read through that book, if you do read through it, I skimmed through it about three days because it's rather boring. Uh, basically, they say that the insiders, the, the movers and shakers, will build underground cities, live down there while the world is in destruction. And when the world comes out of the destruction, they will crawl out of the holes and then conquer the world. Have you done any research on anything like that? That's exactly what they've done. You know, when, uh, if a nuclear uh, attack takes on America, what does the fine, courageous president and vice president do? Fly to NORAD. Hide. Like little cowards. You see? Hide and let us get, get the brunt of the action. That's usually what they do. They have underground tunnels that go from NORAD up to Greeley, uh, Colorado. Run clear down to the uh, Area 51 down in Las Vegas. And Bill Snubler says they run clear up into Seattle. Now, most of the stuff down from Area 51 has been moved up into Seattle because too many people... Not from America. Too many people in Japan learned about Area 51, and some people in America start picking up on it. But the idea is they're digging down in the ground. But they, the funny thing is these people forget that God can cause earthquakes. That's a bad place to be in an earthquake. And when you read about the great earthquake in Revelation chapter 6, it says that the kings of the earth will cry out to the rocks to have them fall on them. Why? Because they're down there hiding. You see, and everything is just being set up as, as beautiful as can be. Okay, though they dig into hell, okay, he says, then shall mine hand take them, uh, take them. And though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Uh, verse 3, and though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, and I will search and take them out thence, and though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, he shall bite them. The bottom of the sea, what is associated with the bottom of the sea? A serpent, a snake down there. And is it any wonder that the snake and, a, and hell are connected in the bottom of the sea? And there could be, there could be gates or doors into hell at the bottom of the three deepest places in the ocean, the Mariana Trench of the Pacific Ocean, the Puerto Rico Trench in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, also known in the, in the Bermuda Triangle, and the Java Trench of the Indian Ocean. The one over in Japan, the Pacific Ocean, is often called the Devil's Triangle. 
And I, I forget which one, if it's the Japan or the Bermuda Triangle, is, is the one that uh, is the deepest down under, you know, the, the land going down deepest. And isn't it any wonder that Bermuda Triangle is a very, very odd place. A lot of weird things have taken place there. If you look in the World Book Encyclopedia, it will say something like the Bermuda Triangle, and it says something like that 57 or 50-some airplanes and ships have been lost in the Bermuda Triangle, but we just count that as coincidence. If you saw the same person 57 times in one week, I think you would begin to wonder if they're trying to follow you. And the Bermuda Triangle is a very, very odd place, very weird place. Uh, there's a place where the, in that area where the wind stops blowing. And in the old days when they have ships and when their only form of a trend, mode of uh, motion was by wind only, if that ship happened again in that place, Sargasso Sea as it's called, the ship would stop and they could never get it going and the, often the plankton and everything and the sea life would grow on that ship and the, and the ship would eventually sink and the sailors were lost. And that's right there in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. Years ago, Jacques Cousteau took a, little, took a little gathering down there and came up white as a ghost and wouldn't tell anybody what he saw down there. And so there's, the earth is like shaped like a donut, so it's hollow on the inside. Okay, and so it's down in the bottom of the sea. Thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Okay, remember, this is God seeking them out. For what? God is seeking them out to destroy them. A very sad thing. This is a sight of God by the grace of God that a person never sees. As a result of Calvary, we of course have that promise that we won't see that sight. Verse 4, he says, And though they go into captivity before their enemies, okay, they, Israel, captivity, enemies, Muslims, Arabs, thence will I command the sword and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not good. Now God forewarned about that. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, one of the strangest verses in the Bible. Not a difficult verse to, uh, to understand. Very easy verse to understand. But a difficult verse to believe. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28 is a parallel of Leviticus 26. And it basically lays out where they have, both of them lay out very similar, where they, the first 10 or 14 verses are, will be the blessings that Israel can receive when they are right with God, and then the rest of it's cursings that they're going to get when they're wrong, when they're out of fellowship with God. Deuteronomy 28, verse 63 is a very odd verse. It shows about the holiness of God. It shows about God's justice. It shows that God is true and right when he judges it shows that when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, God was absolutely right in killing all the men, women, children, all the animals, everybody. All the strange flesh, all the aliens in Sodom and Gomorrah, because it says that they were wholly given over to fornication and they sought strange flesh. God was absolutely right when he flooded the earth. And when Abraham bargained with God about Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, Shall not the judge of the earth do right? And God did right. God is holy. Deuteronomy 28, God is right on this too, obviously. Verse 20, uh, 63. It says, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good, and to multiply you. Now that's very easy to understand. And that's very understandable. Yes, God will rejoice over Israel to bless them, to do them good. But he's given a simile here. The two words, as and like, or in this place, as and so. And it came to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, bring you to naught. You shall be plucked off from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. That's the sight of God that is, is a terrible sight to see. It did not say, for a long time, I, when I learned about the tribulation and about how God killed the Jews, for a long time I thought it would break God's heart to do that. And God would probably be weeping. But not according to that verse. That verse says that God is rejoicing. 
That's like a sadistic laugh. In Proverbs chapter 1, he reinforces that idea where he says that he, God will bring calamity on them. And he says, I will laugh at their calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. God has been mocked for 6,000 years by man. He has put up with this for thousands of years. And he who gets the last laugh laughs best. And God gets the last laugh. In Psalms 2, the first four verses where it talks about the heathen raging and imagine a vain thing. And the heathen are getting together to the United Nations. And they mock God. They make fun of the God. They make fun of the Bible. And they use God. They have a little statue in front where it's got a, par a portion of Isaiah 2 verse 4 to, you know, piously say that they're going to bring in peace on earth. And they quote a partial uh, verse of Isaiah 2 4, mocking God. And God in heaven says, watch this, you knuckleheads. I'm going to get all you people together so I can strike one match and torch you all. And I'm going to laugh when I'm doing it. I've had it up to here with you. That's the side of God that is not discussed on Christian television. The Baptists don't want to talk about that side of God because that produces fear. And we're to fear that God. Okay, this is Amos chapter 9. This is what this country boy is writing about. He said, I will set mine eyes upon them for evil. Now, I don't have the cross re reference there for evil, but a good one, if you want to write in a margin, is Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. Let's see if I can get the exact uh, verse so you don't have to scribble and write the wrong one. Lamentations 3, verse 38. Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. And another good cross-reference on that is Isaiah 45, verse 7. That one says, I, the Lord, create light, I create evil. Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form the light and create darkness, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Okay, Lamentation, remember, is a doctrinal reference or doctrinal pitch of the Jews in the tribulation time period. And uh, I believe a person ought to, on occasion, not too often, but I think you ought to find some uh, books writing about the Holocaust. I think you ought to read what happened to the Jewish people during that time. Not for, you know, uh, just sadistic reasons, but to realize what people have gone through. And they've gone through it because they rejected God. Amos 9, verse 5. The Lord God of hosts is... Is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt. Okay, now when God, God is in control of the elements of the earth, you know, one in Mark chapter, what is it, 8, uh, where the apostles were amazed that the winds and the sea obey him. And the closer we get to coming to Christ because of this great danger that we have called, you know, the uh, global warming. You can see that's really affecting us badly. Uh, that the earth is going to, uh, the, uh, the, the um, environment or the climate is going to have some very odd reactions. In the Bible, the, the Bible mentions the main reason for earthquakes. Scientists will tell you, you know, it's a fault and all this stuff. The Bible shows that the earth quakes for two basic reasons. One is because of the sinfulness of man. The earth itself vomits out its inhabitants, it says in, in Leviticus. And the other reason the earth quakes or it shakes is because it's, it's when the glory of God is revealed. The earth shook at the presence of God when the Ten Commandments were given. And the earth shook during Calvary when the sins of man was placed on Jesus Christ. And the earthquakes are on the increase. We are setting a, about 100, about uh, maybe 200 miles from the the fault of the largest earthquake that could hit this country down in uh, Tennessee. And this thing hit so bad in the early 1900s that it caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards and sometimes. And this thing is, I, you know, some think that it's about ready to go again, but who knows. But I would dare say if it's going to go, it's going to go, and it's going to hit during the tribulation time period more than anything. Isaiah 24 writes about an earthquake where it says that the earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard. Mother Nature shakes at the presence of God. Mother Nature submits to Father God. 
And verse 5, the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land and it shall melt. And all that dwell therein shall mourn. And it shall rise up holy like a flood. It shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven. The stories like the stories on the Noah's Ark where it had three stories, three floors. Where heaven is divided in three parts. You have the first heaven, atmosphere. The second heaven, sun, moon, and stars. Third heaven, the throne of God. 2 Corinthians 12. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heavens and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. God is in control of all that. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says that the earth is maintained, upheld by the word of his power. Now verse 7 is a racist comment of the Bible. You don't want to write and read about this to anybody. and You don't want to gloss over this. Most people will gloss over it. He says to those Jews, Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? You just a bunch of... You act like them people. Now, you know, you get re revealing this stuff. That's a general... Uh, that's a general comment about certain races. Uh, each race has uh, some assets or some uh, great qualities that they can, you know, do some things better than another race. Okay, and each race has their drawbacks, except for the Dutch race, of course. But uh, most of them have their uh, drawbacks. Okay, and so uh, this is where all the racial jokes reveal the humor. And, of course, you can't tell them nowadays. Because people are so, so thin-skinned. But um, this, is a, this is a comment about the Ethiopian people or Africans. That's where the Jews came out of. And Leviticus chapter 18 describes the doings of Egypt. And you read Leviticus 18, it describes fornication from top to bottom. And that's a natural uh, comment about a race of people. He said, are ye, not, are ye not like the Ethiopians? In Titus chapter 2, one of the prophets, a black man, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. That's a black man talking about his people. Now, when a white man says something about a black man, that is racist. A black man can say all he wants. He can call us crackers and all that stuff, and that's a big hoot. I don't care if they call me cracker. Just put a little peanut butter on it. Okay, but yet a black when a black man a, a black man that says the truth about his people and says the truth about Obama, that's a blessing because they're telling the truth. I've heard several black guys call the Limbaugh and says, you know what? People tell me I listen to Limbaugh. Man, that's a bad thing. You you know you and Uncle Tom. If you want to deal with racism, look at that black race. Go to a hockey game. A white man's sport and count the people in the audience and look at the racial makeup go to a black man or a NBA a basketball game who's obviously better in that sport I wonder where the whites aren't screaming for affirmative action in the NBA you see I tell you this is constantly put in your face and my face by the news media and what this cause, the biggest cause of racial tension in our country is the news media and the government. They are the driving force behind it. Not your average redneck kid who's got a Confederate flag on his, on his license plate on his truck. The racism of this country is pushed by people like Obama. The news media and the government, when they force the races together, that's what causes more racial hatred than anything when they're forced and crammed together. When people voluntarily choose, that's their choice, that's a different ball game. And the greatest uniter of the races is the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you come to Jesus Christ, you're one in Jesus Christ. But he is saying to those Jews there, you are acting like the Ethiopians. I saved you out of that. And if you look at the church today, it's a phenomenal thing. 
When you and I read the Old Testament, you hear about those Jews wanting to go to back to Egypt and they were slaves in Egypt. Don't you kind of think, what a bunch of knuckleheads. What's the church done today? What has Christians done today? What kind of music do they play in church? African. What kind of Bible is they reading? The NIV, New American Standard, New King James, African. They come out of Alexandria. The church today has gone right back. And if you go to the churches, you'll find the boys have got their whole tackle box on their face. That's African. You see? That's all African culture, African morals, and they're going right back to it. And that's a sign of judgment. And that's always the lowest uh, common denomination when you're going right back to that. And that's the music that the Antichrist will use to unite the races. It's African music. You see, and of course, Amos chapter 9, verse 7, Are you not as the children of Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Saith the Lord. Now, even though that is true about those people, but there was a woman from Canaan, a Canaanite, a black lady, who got her answer to prayer in Matthew chapter 15. Even though this is laid out uh, generically about that race, that race tends to be more spiritual. Okay, and that race in Matthew 15, this one dear lady caught Jesus Christ in his speech and got an answer to prayer where the Pharisees couldn't catch him. And then in Acts chapter 8, the first man to actually get born again with the knowledge that the born again uh, experience in the New Testament was based on the blood atonement of Jesus Christ was the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts 8, you got a black man getting saved. In Acts 9, a brown man getting saved. In Acts 10, a white boy getting saved, an Italian. And they all get saved by coming to a Jewish Messiah. The time I was in Jasper County Jail and got to talk to this black guy and he's smarter off to me. He says, suppose you think Jesus was white. With an attitude like that, I returned the favor. I said, suppose you think he was black. And he says, well, he had hair, you know, black as wool, white as wool. I said, wool. He said, I got woolly hair. I said, I said that was a color. It didn't say he had woolly hair, my friend. I said, besides, he's not white, he's not black, he's brown. Now, I could throw in that red-brown of Song of Solomon. Fair-complected Jew. He's a Jew. What's the big deal? Why do they got to make him black? Because of prejudice. He's a Jew, and everybody comes to a Jewish Messiah and gets salvation. You see, anybody that brings up the race factor has lost the argument. That's their last ditch argument. Whenever that's always, when that's brought up, they've lost their argument all the way. You know, somebody says something about Obama, you don't like because he's black. I said, no, I don't like his white side either. Or his red side, his communist side. That's not the issue. So that's the comment. He said, are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians and me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord, have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? I took you out of that mess. And the Philistines from Kephor and the Syrians from Kerr. He said, I took you out of that. Why are you going back to it? Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. That's Israel. And I would destroy it from off the face of the earth. Saving. Uh, exception. Saving. That I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. So there's a slight promise there. And that promise is going to be answered in verse 11. So the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. Now, a lot of people call Israel the holy lands. And I've been there, and it ain't holy. It's actually dirty, trashy. And then you go into the Jewish sections all the time, you usually find the triple X all publicized because pornography is, is right out in the open in Israel. And the Lord says, my eyes are on that sinful kingdom. Verse 9, for lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Okay, now if you're raising a farm, you know what a sieve is. Okay, it's uh, one, one easy way to describe it is like a screen that you can put sand through. Okay, where a sieve that... In a, in a combine, you have what's called in the back where you got the sieve and it's got a, a thing that shakes the grain and all the trash and then the, the seed falls down through the sieve and then the wind blows the chaff out the back of the combine. Okay, the ungodly like the chaff which the wind driveth away 
And then when the seeds fall down, then they're augered up into the grain tank, and that's like uh, taking somebody up in a rapture. Now, the combine is a great picture of the second coming of Christ. But he said, I'm going to sift you as corn is sifted. Now, the Lord prayed about uh, Peter where he said that Satan wants to sift you as wheat. Verse 10, he says, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. Sinners in the Old Testament refers to extremely wicked people. Sinners in the New Testament refers to each and every one of us. But under the Old Testament covenant, the first time the word sinners is found out is in Genesis 13, 13, and that's referring to sodomites and murderers. Okay, and that's why uh, if you witness to somebody mention the word sinner, often people will say, well, I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. Okay, that's an Old Testament definition of sinners. The New Testament, the bar has been raised. So that's where he's applying that. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. That's an attitude that Americans have. Oh, America is a powerful nation. America is going to live forever. The economy is recovering. It won't hit us. It won't affect us. Yeah, they thought that in the 1930s. 1929, during what's called the gay 90s. In the 20s, or the gay 20s. They thought that until the bankers pulled the rug out from under them. You see, and so when a people have that mindset, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. The Bible still says all nations that forget God shall be brought into hell. America is no exception. If the Bible is true, it says that all nations are going to turn against Israel. America is no exception on that. Uh, historically speaking, because of the Christian influence of our country, this country has been pro-Israel. But that's changing. That's changing very fast. The Aryan nations, they hate Israel. Anti-Semiticism is really expanding in this country. Of course, you've got two or three major world, world religions that are absolutely anti-Semitic, where they believe that Israel is absolutely done and they're going to get Jerusalem. And one is the Catholics. The other is the Mormons. They call themselves Israel. JWs consider that. And then, of course, you've got many of the patriots across this country, the Arians. And so it's definitely on the rise. Okay, so that's all the negative. Verse 11, now we get into the upside here. In that day, when you read that in the Old Testament, you're dealing with the second coming of Christ. The most important day of the Bible, the greatest doctrine of the Bible, the most promising day of the Bible, when Jesus Christ, his son, becomes king of kings and lord of lords. I mean, when he gets his just dues, when he finally gets the glory that's due him, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, the good old days, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. There's our Muslims. There they are right there, Edomites, Esau. At the end of the next letter, this next little book, the vision of Obadiah, when you get down to verse 17 of Obadiah, this little book basically describes the basic attitude of the Edomites where they're going to rat on the Jews, kill the Jews. They're going to be ratting on them during the tribulation time period. So somebody comes in, takes everything they got. And in verse 17, the tables are turned and it says Israel will become a fire and Edom will become stubble. And the Lord's going to torch them. Saudi Arabia, it's interesting how Saudi Arabia almost always gets a pass. Why do they get a pass? Why is it that when 9-11, special airplanes left the ground after the planes were grounded and took some rich people to Saudi Arabia? Why was that? Why was it that 15 of the 19 supposed bombers on those planes were Saudis? Why is it that we didn't attack Saudi and we went after Iraq. Something very strange going on. Why is it that over 1,300, 1300 architects have studied the 911, the planes, the, the buildings coming down, and have said that that was not caused by a plane, that was an implosion? 
That was a deep, that was a planned demolition. When that thing, those buildings came down at the speed of gravity. No plane could ever have done that. Why is it that Building 7 came down when no plane hit it? A lot of weird stuff going on. And of course, when a person studies that, you get all bent out of shape. But when you study your Bible, you get excited. Because the Bible predicts these things. The Bible forewarns us of these things. The Bible reveals to us that high political figures or political figures are corrupt people. You say, well, they go to the point to kill Americans in order to give up a right. You ain't a kid and they'll do it. You say, which ones? Left and right. The left-right paradigm is an amazing thing in our country. The left side wants to steal 70% of your money. The right side, 50%. Both crooks, both thieves. And it's a big game that's going on where the ones at the top try to play this left-right thing in our country. And Americans actually think that they have a say-so. They got no say-so. None whatsoever. The, say, the best say-so that you have is to live a holy life. That's the best say so. To get on your knees and pray for your country, pray for your people in this land, pray for saved and lost alike, get in your Bible, preach the gospel in the street corner. That's the most patriotic thing that you could do for your country. Right there. Why? Because the Bible foretells all these things. You see, the problem is a lot of people understand those things in America, but when they have no Bible basis, then they go wacko, they go nuts. The Bible helps us to understand when you see these things, you get excited because Jesus Christ is coming back. And this Bible is so true. It's running the show. He says in verse 10 that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Saudi Arabia is going to be turned into a pitch, a hell fire. And all the, all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And I know a few farmers like that where they just don't get out there and get anything. Now, that's just sheer laziness nowadays. But in the millennial time period, the interesting thing about the crops where the sun will produce a seven-fold uh, uh, powerful sun and not to burn, but to grow better crops where now you're able to plant a crop one time a year, you know, in spring and harvest in the fall. In the millennial time period, you plant at the beginning of spring, first day of spring, first week of spring, harvest into spring, plant again summer, harvest into summer, plant again fall, harvest again at the end of, plant again at the beginning of winter four times a year. You say, gonna get busy. Yeah, but no weeds, no pesticides, no herbicides. Crops full and running over. It is going to be absolute fun and enjoyable to watch that. You know, where the grapes, will be the, a cluster of grapes, you got to carry, two men got to carry, where now you, a cluster of grapes, you go to the store and you pick them up and you grab out and walk out. You know, where a grape, you can stick your, you eat it like an apple. I mean, it's going to be a phenomenal time period. It says, the days will come, the Lord, the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, he that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine. And all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. Great promise of the Bible. The captivity of my people Israel. And they shall build the waste cities. Israel is going to be absolutely obliterated during the tribulation time period. According to Judges chapter 5, the interstates will be used for their main and sole purpose. What's the sole purpose of the interstates? To move the military. Nobody will be traveling on the highways during the tribulation time period. It will be reserved for the military and the military only. And the highways will be uninhabited. According to Judges chapter 5, the highways will be uninhabited in Israel and worldwide. He said, they will build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord God. And when God makes that statement, that comes true. Right there, that great promise of Israel, Isaiah 65, verse 18 to 25, shows the great promise. 
where then all the animals go back to a vegetarian state, okay, or a fruititarian or very one, or eating grain only. All the animals revert, revert back to that, where a person can have a real live teddy bear, I mean a real live one, and uh, all the, all the crops, will, the earth itself gets born again. The term regeneration is only found two times in the Bible. Titus chapter 3 refers it to the regeneration of the soul. And Matthew 19 verse 28 refers to the regeneration of the earth. Where the earth gets born again and everything resorts back to Garden of Eden days. People live long. No sickness. No war. No pests. The crops will be grown three, t four times a year. It is going to be a phenomenal time. Now, the poor old J.W. tries to entice people with that. That poor old J.W. is telling people about the earth living forever. Well, they can have it. Because after that, the earth is going to blow up. Revelation chapter 20, he's going to blow it up, and then he's going to make everything all spanking new. New heaven, new Jerusalem, new earth it's all going to be brand new and that's the great promises of the world the greatest and most joyous time will be the second coming of jesus christ okay we'll stop there let's go ahead and pray lord thank you for the great promises of your word help us to spend time in this word so we might understand it more fully and lord i pray you help us to see the events that's taken place throughout the world and in this nation and to see that the bible is in control the churches are in a mess and acting like Ethiopians and Egyptians because the Bible says it's going to be that way. The world is getting together, uniting together to hate the Jew, to hate God. Why is that? Because the Bible says so. The natural catastrophes will be on the increase. Earthquakes will increase. Tornadoes, hurricanes. Why? Because the earth shakes at the presence of God. Lord, we're looking forward to that day. And the last prayer in this Bible says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And oh, let it be today. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be faithful until that day comes. In Jesus' name, amen.